Hey everyone, and welcome to our first Pro Training Business webinar for the year featuring topics and presenters from NICES and Viserys. Before we start, I'd like to review a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. Here's a quick review of what you'll see on your screen. To the left of your screen is the viewer where you see the presentation. To the right is a control panel where you can ask questions. The control panel will automatically uh, collapse when not in use. To keep it open, click the View menu and uncheck Auto Hide Control Panel. You have joined this webinar in listen-only mode, which means you are muted. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions by typing your questions into the pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation, and we will address them during the Q&A session at the end. Also via the control panel, you can download resource documents that our presenters have provided by going to the handouts pane anytime during the webinar. Later today, you will receive a follow-up email containing the webinar recording. With that, I'll turn it over to Viserys' Director of Marketing, Andrew Sear, to get us started. Thanks, Chris. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Glad to have you with us as we kickstart 2024. Excited to have uh, two guests, two panelists with us today. Um, this uh, particular uh, business webinar is gonna be focused on Viserys Inventory Manager, an extremely valuable tool, especially as you continue to grow your business and manage your products. Um, this webinar is sponsored by our friends at NYSIS Corporation. And so we're going to have John Singletary uh, present to us uh, talking about small flies and the control of them. Um, so, John, we appreciate you being with us. Just a quick bio on John. His experience in the pest control industry spans over 16 years, and his background includes work in the service distribution and product manufacturing sectors. Before entering the pest control world, John spent years in the restaurant and food service industry. Together, these experiences inform his unique perspective on pest management and the protection of public health. John, over to you. Well, thank you, Andrew, and thank you everyone for attending. I appreciate you guys, guys having us and having this opportunity. And today we're gonna to talk about becoming a small fly slayer. And we're gonna talk about um, NICES Corporation and a couple of the products that we have. Uh, one is the OG, I like to refer to, it's been around a while. And the other one's a relatively novel product we've had out for a year and a half. And the combination of these two, we're gonna really talk you through how to win and grow your business with the proven small fly program that is out there on the market. We have decade, decades of success with this. So a little bit, let's get started about who NICES is. Uh, uh, the nicest story, Nicest is a Borey-based company in the foothills, nestled in the foothills of the Smoky Mountains in Rockford, Tennessee. Uh, something important and near and dear to our hearts is the Responsible Care Initiative. And what that is exactly is, is that we transport, transparently report on our performance to the American Chemistry Council on a range of metrics. This includes waste minimization, water consumption, greenhouse gases, hazardous air pollution, um, OSHA incident, OSHA incidence rates, pro and then also to our process safety. We report these annual metrics every year for a goal, and that goal is to show continued improvement in these critical areas of lowering our environmental impact and then also bringing safety incidents closer and closer to zero. Why? Because we care about our employees, we care about our community, and we care about the environment as a whole. We are fully committed to the Responsible Care Initiative. Uh, we do source domestically in the United States. We produce domestically in the United States. So we definitely are a made in America product. And that smiling, handsome fellow that you see there, that's Lee Barrett. He's our company president. He really is the driver of the Responsible Care Initiative. So let's go back to where I started with this about borates and exactly what are borates and take a quick look at the mode of action of borates. And because this is a, some mystery to this, it's been around a while and, and folks are not quite sure exactly what they are and how they work. Well, they're inorganic borate salts, um, and two of the derivatives from there are boric acid, or more specifically, our boric acid that we that, that we selected, which is disodium octoborate tetrahydrate, and that is the active ingredient in Nibor D. We selected that for its water solubility and a few other factors. Um, not all boric acids are created created equal, but what they do have in common is borates are UV and temperature stable. And what does that mean? That means they're not gonna break down over time. They don't have a half-life in them like synthetic pyrethroids do. 
Um, Nibor D is considered green technology and is labeled for drains. Uh, the mode of action it, with, with borates, they're primarily a stomach toxin and um, they're not a neurotoxin, say like synthetic pyrethroids are. And what happens is the borate, the boron rather, is going to bind to the NAD enzyme in the, in the insect's midgut. And what that prevents is that prevents a, 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 another coenzyme or an enzyme byproduct, was, which is NADH. And that is what is, that is, what is, is essential for them to trans, transform their, what they digest and what they eat into energy, into their food. Quite, quite simply, um, insects or arthropods cannot digest borates, okay? Um, vertebrates, and I say vertebrates because that includes not only humans, but domestic pets, wildlife, um, we can all process borates uh, because we have livers and kidneys and insects cannot, arth arthropods cannot. So that's the basic back of the envelope of why borates are considered green, green, green technology and why, they, why one reason why they last forever. Again, they're, they're borate salt. They literally are the salt of the earth. They're borate salts that are mined from, from boron, California. So what are some of the axioms of being a small fly uh, slayer? And the axioms, I mean, what are some of the givens? What are some of the things that we're always going to run into? Well, the first thing, and there's five of them here that I'm going to go over with you. The first thing is small flies have a complete dependence on all stages of their life on moist organic material. Okay. Um, the second thing, and these kind of go hand in glove, if you have not found the larva of the pupa, you've not located the source. And going back to really one and two, the muck and the crud, there, this is the breeding area that that harvests that, that harbors the larval activity, and, could, and traditionally controls of this would be what we call inch by inch pest control, and that on its own is is very time consuming. Okay, number three, adult flies are not always located near the source, right? And this is true. University of Cal, uh, UCAL Berkeley did a study uh, and and established that that uh, red eyes or or fruit flies rather. Um, can fly up to eight miles. Okay, they just don't have to. And what they're doing is in your in in your accounts, they're using their sense of smell to navigate and fo follow different CO2s that are beneficial and and odors and definitely fermenting odors is one thing that th that they're attracted to. Number four, small flies are not always stemming from the floor drain. This is another common misconception. Anywhere where decaying moist organic material can collect, this can become a breeding zone or what we like to call I like I like to call a cryptic breeding area. And number five, this is probably the most important, assume the customer is not going to do a darn thing, okay? Assume they're not going to make any structural corrections. They're not going to provide any adequate set sanitation. They're not going to listen to you. They're just going to say, yeah, please just make the flies go away, all right? So NYSIS has changed the approach to include basically, we're going to play the hand we're dealt. We're thinking outside the box. And what are we going to do in this method? Instead of getting bogged down in these arguments and these conversations, we're just going to take a convert that crud Rather, and, and, and we're going to convert it with a residue that turns this muck and crud in, in these breeding areas into a toxic food source. And that is really the basis of how Nibor D and this, this Bore technology works to help you slay these small flies. Okay. So some, what are some of the challenges that we deal with when we're dealing with small fly controls? Why are we so hesitant to take these accounts on? Well, first thing is, is inch by inch pest control. You know, in traditional terms, inch by inch pest control is required here to isolate and clean and remediate each one of these breeding areas where the moisture and new organic materials are going to collect and support this larval development. And traditionally, a lack of cooperation with your sanitation is just going to work against this, going to, going to work against your efforts here. So inch by inch pest control is very time consuming. And it's very hard to win the day. Also, too, getting in there the right time of day to do the service and also other scheduling obstacles because this inch by inch pest control can be time consuming. We want to figure out a ways where we don't have to worry about the time of day and then or also, too, that we can use these scheduling obstacles to our advantage. OK, because what happens is if all we're doing is the inch by inch pest control and all we're doing is we're going in, we're spraying some stuff and we're putting out some traps. This is a conventional program that really will become ineffective over time. And it's going to devolve into basically what, what, what's turned into, hey, man, can't you just make these adults go away? We're going to be harvesting and we're going to be managing the population. We're not, really, we're not really snuffing the population out. All we're doing is managing it to, make it to make it more livable. And that's not really an answer. So you're harvesting and your management. And what does that equal? That equals callbacks. And quite frankly, callbacks is our bad word 
in, in this industry. And we'll, we'll get into that because they really can cost us as operators. What are some of the hidden costs in retreats or these callbacks? Okay, you have your labor cost, right? You have your trip time, you have your fuel costs. Okay, those are some of your, your biggest exp expenses. And then also too, you have your material expense of, of, of knocking down, you know, and the management, think about the number of vinegar traps you're putting out, the amount of space spray that you use, or, or the number of times that you have to go back to, to, to an account. Um, so also too, you know, how, how did, how did these, how did these, um, callbacks adversely affect your route production and your scheduling? Okay. So let's think about it. We're coming out of football season. Let's think about it in this context. We're driving down the field. Okay. We're driving down the field and we're getting ready to kick a field goal. All right. But that field goal gets blocked. Okay. So now not only did that field goal get blocked, but he got run back for a touchdown. So not only are we out the three points that we were trying to get on the scoreboard, but we're also down six points where they ran it down, ran, ran it back for a touchdown. It's the same situation when we're doing callbacks because we're we're doing we're we're, we're rehashing these same accounts that are not being that are not paying or they've already paid, but we're not generating any revenue versus being able to go out there and, and getting new service and building our business. We're over here in this 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 section over here. We're just kind of spinning our wheels. And over here, over here, we're, we're able to go out and we're able to use that time to acquire new businesses and expand and grow our business. But I would argue that the biggest cost of all of it, the largest hidden cost, is the loss of customer satisfaction and trust. My dad used to say, trust leaves on horseback and returns on foot. And what I mean by that is, is once you've lost the trust of a customer, it is almost impossible to get back. All right. So all these things, these are the costs that, that when we go out and we have to go back and do a callback on an account. These are some of the costs that we incur. And callbacks really are where profits go to die. So let's talk about these cryptic breeding areas here. Go back to axiom number one. Small flies have a complete dependence on all stages of life on moist or gay decaying materials. We can see this is not a drain. Okay, this is an area where where the integrity in this in this video, the structural integrity of this floor has been busted up, and they're hosing down this floor and they're pushing the water into these cracks and crevices, and they're creating these cryptic breeding areas. Anywhere where moisture or decaying material, organic material can accumulate, you know, this can create these cryptic breeding areas and structural faults are usually a, a big cause of these. Um, my colleague, George Williams likes to say, nature likes, nature likes to hide in plain sight. And with this exercise, we just say, hey, how many total drains and cryptic breeding areas do you see in both images? You know, um, George also likes to say, and it's not just, not, not just GW, but, but you know, your small fly problems are going to be about 80% of the time it's going to be cryptics and 20% of the, of the time it's going to be drains. Maybe that's a 70-30 split. But my point is, is that when we get small flies, the first thing we do is run to the drains and take a look at the drains. And there's so much more to that. Anywhere the organic material can collect and build up becomes one of these cryptic breeding areas. So in this exercise, we're looking at it. We think we see two drains, but I actually see one there, drain stub there, another drain stub there. There's three. There's another drain stub there letting out on the floor. Okay, and there's the actual floor drain itself. So we got five areas that we really got to take a good look at. We see where this material is accumulated. We got another drain hose over here on the right-hand picture. You get the picture. Those two drain hoses are coming down from soda, soda beverage service areas. Okay, and then you have the floor drain itself. Uh, let's not sleep on these little legs here, the table legs here that I'm circling right now. They're straddling that grout line. That is more than enough space for organic material to collect, moisture to collect. And we all know that that cockroaches. This can be a, a cryptic breeding, a cryptic harborage area, or a hidden harborage area for cockroaches in those table legs. Hey, if it works for roaches, it'll play for it'll play for the small flies too, because you're getting moisture in that organic material that they need. The bar mats. How often are they cleaned? How often are they moved? Hey, when they mop at night, it doesn't look like they mop at night, or they actually picking up this hose and moving. So you could see all of the cryptic breeding areas that are hidden in these two pictures. When we first glance, we look at this, we see two drains, okay? That's the point. So then we ask the, we ask the PMPs, what are you doing for the drains? And, and that's where the answers get really murky. You say, what are, you putting, what are you putting down for small flies? You know, what are you doing? What are you doing for drains? And we ask them what they're doing, they'll tell us. We ask them why they're doing that, and that's where it gets really murky because the functions of microbials and these enzyme cleaners, okay, they really misunderstood. This is biosanitation. These microbials break down the fats, oils, and greases, that crud that I'm talking about. But if you have an embedded fly situation, biosanitation enough is not gonna be enough, uh, biosanitation alone is not gonna be enough to combat 
the embedded small fly issues that you have, okay? Your biosanitation is gonna remove the materials that are the conducive into the feeding and the harborage and the breeding, okay? But there is no residual, there's no insecticidal action. We don't have anything that's gonna kill the small fly or the larva in these two products. And if all we're doing is putting down a microbial and we're not doing anything else, you're gonna lose the account before you have any significant progress. So you say, well, where's the gift that keeps on giving? Where's the residual, John? It's Nibor D. And Nibor D has a decade of small fly successes. And what happens here is through drain foaming, and drain foaming is one of the ways that we deliver this product. It, it, we've been coating the lines and we've been converting that organic gunk that I've been talking about into a toxic food source for the developing fl fly larvae. It's going to leave a borate laden residue on these breeding materials, okay? Um, this is a proven tank mixing protocol. It does require foaming and some scheduling considerations either before, before or after hours, but let's break down some of this protocol that I'm talking about. Um, at the beginning, you probably got a lot of DSV. You might have some DSV laying around from the COVID days. I bet you didn't know if you take a look at that DSV, disinfectant sanitizer virus side, one of our products is actually labeled for drains um, and it actually has small flies on the label. Um, so we have, a, we have a, a dilution, excuse me, we have a mixed card, mixed card or a protocol card here that is available and that QR code, if you'd like to take a moment and scan that, that will take you directly, that, that, will, that will take you directly to the drain protocol card that we have there for you. And then also to um, this, this link that's over here on the right hand side, that will take you directly to the resources page too. But in this, we could find our protocols on how we mix, how we mix the uh, NIBOR D and these different, the DSV and these different components to back us out. A couple things. One, we just came out with Nibor D uh, in the one pound package. So one pound of Nibor D to one gallon of water is gonna give you a 10% solution, a very aggressive solution that's gonna help knock, that's gonna knock out any small fly populations that you have, very good for an initial, initial application. The second thing that I would say, if we're gonna be tank mixing out there, let's take a select an IGR that is labeled for drains because we found out some very interesting information about IGRs, okay? so. Nibor D in commercial kitchens, it is the disodium octoborate tetrahydrate or Nibor D or, or, or the Nibor D. I'm sorry, I'm repeating myself there. A wide label of application areas, restaurants, food production, hotels, hospitals, schools, very versatile. We could take, if all you had was Nibor D and you had a small fly problem, it is labeled that you could dust the drains. We can mix it into a compressed air sprayer and apply it as a spray. We can apply it as a foam or even in a mop solution. One of the drawbacks or one of the one, one, one of the things that you need to take into consideration is that in this formulation, we cannot apply it in food service or production areas while they're in operation. If they're making, making the pizza dough or they're cleaning up after at night and the food's out, then we have to time these applications for, for, for what's considered after hours or off, air, off hours. And I would say this always, I'll say it with any product that we talk about, always read and understand the label prior to every use. Okay, so I go back to why do we use it as a foam? How and why is line foaming the superior efficacy, especially when we're talking about small flies? Well, if we take a look at this illustration over on the, on the left-hand side, liquids, liquid, excuse me, the right-hand side, liquids and gels, they only contact the lower portion of the plumbing, okay? But your decaying organic material is gonna collect in the entire drain pipe. And what happens is this expanding foam pushes that borate active ingredient into all the cracks and crevices of the pipes and the drain systems. And this is gonna contact surfaces that the liquids and the gels just simply cannot. This is gonna get you deep into places where the organic material accumulates and becomes these cryptic breeding areas that I was talking about, okay? And you want the fam to, foam to expand. Over here on the right-hand side in this frame, here you see the, see the foam coming up from the round drain. Looks like the old Play-Doh Play -Doh machine. That's what you want. You want it squishing out. You want the foam to expand up and contact the bottom, the underside of these drain grates. Because by doing that, if we didn't and we just pulled this trench drain off, all of this material that's on the bottom side of the drain would still be viable for breeding. But by leaving this drain cover on and expanding the foam up so it contacts everything, all of that muck and crud will now have a dried, dried Nibor D residue on it, which will be fatal. To, to, to the insects. So we talked about the mixing it up. We talked about putting it into a, 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 a foam and I give you the drain protocol card. And you say, well, John, I don't, I don't have time for that. I can't get in there at the right time of day. Uh, I don't need all of that. I just need a little bit. I need to do some precision applications. Well, we listened and this is what we came up with. 
We've been out for about a year and a half with this product and it is just going gangbusters. Nibor D plus IGR. What we found out about IGR is when small flies are exposed to IGRs that they are, they become sterile um, in, in very short order. But the biggest benefits of these, of these products here is, is that they are ready to use. You don't need any additional equipment. It's gonna speed up your service and you're gonna increase production. We've got accounts that, that use this can now, use this package now, and we're mixing batches before. They're doing accounts in 20 minutes that it was taking them an hour to do before. So it's gonna save you time. It's gonna eliminate mixing, eliminate the potential for spills. It's gonna, with the 17 inch hose, it's gonna give you the ability for precision applications. Your Q&A managers that are sitting out there right now, you're gonna know that the proper amount was applied in the even, the proper amount of active ingredient, I should say, was applied in the even and effective delivery. Okay, this, the one biggest part of the game changer is this allows you to do applications while the facility is in operation, okay? So this gives you route flexibility. This gives you the ability to put a can in, in, in a technician's hand and maybe a, maybe a small convenience store or, 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 or maybe a small, small, small like deli or something like that. These folks that nor, aren't normally a commercial route we can take it, we could be more flexible. We could be more flexible with our with our with our routing because it allows these applications to be done while the facility is is in operation. Really, when you get down to it, your time component is your most valuable component. And I would ask you, what is your time worth? So how does it work? The formulation, we're gonna get deep penetration and an even application, like I said. It's it's the unique delivery is gonna give you the ability to deliver it at any angle, horizontal, diagonal. It's gonna get deep into those cracks and crevices and into those areas. Um, we do have a formulation of 5% Nibor D and 0.018% Pyroproxen it is the growth regulator, or Pyroproxen, excuse me. Um, and this is combination chemistry. And what this does is this, this allows us to make sure that all stages of development are stopped in their tracks, the eggs, the larvae, the pupa, the adults, they're not gonna be able to survive and infest or, re or, or reproduce. So it's gonna give us rapid control, it's gonna inhibit the reproductive and the development of cycle, and it's really gonna be, it's gonna help prevent reinfestation in, in, in some of these environments that we're talking about. And you say, well, John, how do we know it works? Well, the proof is in the pudding. You know, a picture says a thousand words. This is courtesy of Food, Drug, and the Bug, Tim Francis. Um, and this is a, uh, this this is a, a audited facility that they do that they that they do the service on up there. And as we can see, this was the beginning. This is your starting point. This is your static point. And after two weeks, two weeks, Nibor D IGR use, you can see the reduction. We, we probably have a 98% reduction in the population working our way towards 100%. So the proof is in the pudding. So you said, John, well, how much is in the can? How much how much do I get? Okay. Well, each can is going to come with a full cone sprayer. So as we see over on the left-hand side, we could do those surface applications if that is a need, but then also each case, it comes in a case of six, each case comes with six of the drain actuators and six of those 17 inch extension hoses. And the cool thing is once that drain actuator is applied, it's not gonna come off and, and make you have accidental um, discharge or misapplication. That, that nozzle is gonna firmly grip that hose. So we're not gonna be shooting hoses down the drains anymore. And added bonus is if we don't have this 17 inch hose anymore, we've lost it, those little 3.3 millimeter standard red tubes work. And as I said before, the up down valve enables you to be able to do an application while holding the can in any particular direction. I know I've put a lot out there right now, but if you need more information, or help, you know, help developing your small fly slayer plan. Hey, your friendly neighborhood's uh, nicest small fly slayer is right out there for, for you. The QR code that is up in the, the right-hand corner of this map here will take you directly to our website, to the resource page, and help you find your nicest representative that will be more than happy to help you develop a battle plan so you can go out and win the day. With that, um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it on over to Richard. We'll do the questions at the end. I want to thank you. And if you have any questions, I'm going to be hanging around till the end. We thank you for your support. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. Thanks for uh, sharing with us how we can be uh, small fly slayers and certainly uh, having your friendly neighborhood uh, nicest folks alongside our Viserys team. We look forward to uh, helping you all um, with this as we go into the season. Um, as we pivot uh, to Richard, uh, who's going to be talking to us about Viserys Inventory Manager, just a brief background for him. Uh, Richard Cruz has resided in San Antonio, Texas for 53 years. 
He's been in urban entomology for 21 years. <clears throat> he also owned and operated a pest management company from 2002 to 2008. After selling the business, he went on to chemical distribution, working for Viserys from 2008 to the present. He is a certified applicator licensed in pest and termite control from Texas. He's also an associate certified entomologist. Um, so Richard, just before I turn this over to you, uh, I see folks are making good use of the, uh, the chat function uh, to post questions. Um, please continue to do so. We will have time at the end for both of our panelists. So appreciate the engagement and uh, Richard, over to you. Thank you, Andrew. Appreciate it. And I appreciate everybody taking the time today and uh, kind of give you guys a, a really about a 20,000 foot view of inventory manager and why that's important in a pest management business. Uh, so we have been on this project at Viserys for about nine years. And if you guys know anything about Viserys, we're very careful about what we bring to market to make sure that it's going to do and, uh, you know, and perform the way we say it's going to perform. And we even do that in our chemistries, um, as you guys know from our history. Uh, so this, this product itself actually stayed in development for almost six years before we rolled it out to the public. And what we have here is a true inventory reconciliation program uh, from the time you get it from a supplier into the branch, branch onto the truck. Now, one of the things that we do here is we separate our truck from our technician because, you know, one of the pointing questions that I ask if you've ever sat in one of my demos or maybe you're currently using BIM or maybe if you're not and you're interested, you'll let us know. Uh, when you start looking at trucks, those are nothing more than many warehouses on wheels. They have your company assets on them. They have your uh, material on those vehicles. So when you start, at, you know, I start asking PMPs how many locations they have, you know, someone will tell me, hey, we run 10 trucks in one brick and mortar. So in essence, really, you have 11 locations because those are well, well marked, well logoed. They're out on the road and they're a mini warehouse on wheels. So one of the things that you know we, we often look at as a PMP is we look at our technician here as our revenue stream, as the, the guy that actually brings in the income, which in, in fact is true. But when we start looking at financial history and trends and products within our business so that you know, with a program like this, we can start buying based on demand of our customer, not just speculation. Um, as Andrew said, I own and operated a pest control company for many years. Uh, and one of the things that I would do is I would go out to the distributor and I would just buy five or six cases of something, stick it on the shelf and, and hope that it would bear fruit. Well, with that, that, that type of logic and, and that type of uh, discipline, I was tying up cash flow within my, my, my PMP business. So it was difficult for me, you know, new shocks, new tires, uh, repairs or add new routes or get into different segments of the business. Because as we know, nothing ties up uh, cash flow in a PMP business quicker than inventory. So when we start looking at this, we made a hard separation within our software between that technician because we can remove these guys and move them around from branch to branch if you're multi-location. Or maybe they, you know, they moved in, in up in the positioning in the company and they're no longer running a route, then we should be able to move these guys wherever we want to. The static location actually is the truck because it has transactional history between your warehouse and your vehicle. So we go through and we set this up in succession. We, we complete your company information. We start to add your branch. The beauty of this software is there's no limit to the amount of locations you can add to this software. There are no limits to the amount of vehicles you can add to this and then associate to multi-branches. And then we add our technicians and associate them back to the vehicle that they belong to. So in essence, we're saying this guides the mini steward. So after all of this is set up, there are some really cool features in here that we have shared as Viserys uh, with our PMP partners out there is how to manage and purchase your chemistries. Again, what I said at the very beginning there was, you know, want to buy based on demand of your customer, not just speculation. So what we did at Viserys is we decided to show you guys how we purchase for our pro centers across the country. And what we do is what's called forecasting within our, within our, uh, warehouses. So if I were to forecast Alpine WSG for my south location, I can use this chart here to tell me and have the software watch my inventory for me and say, hey, look, in January, I want to have 10 on the shelf and I want the software to alert me when I get down to five. So as your technicians are pulling from the warehouse uh, internally, it starts to tick that down to a reorder point. Then the software will alert you internally or management team internally or maybe procurement office that, hey, it's time to order five because you asked me to watch this particular product for you. And now you're purchasing this product based on demand and the, the pull from the technician. 
We give you a 12 month calendar also on this so that you can account for seasonal demand. The other thing you can do is get very, very creative with this. If you're doing bait rotational or maybe chemistry rotational, and you say, look, we wanna use Alpine for January, February, and March, and then maybe I'll offset a forecast for a different product for April, May, and June, but then I wanna rotate back to this one here. Now the software is telling me when it's time to buy that product because I asked the software to watch that particular product for me on a month to month basis. So you can get very, very creative with this calendar here uh, when it comes to ordering, ordering your products. Now, for some of you PMPs that are on the call, if you've ever had a phone call where your technician drives to Mrs. Jones's house and then calls you and says, hey, I don't have what I need to do the job on the truck, what would you like me to do? Well, because I said trucks are nothing more than many warehouses, you can also forecast vehicles. You can tell it that my technician, as he takes a manual inventory count of his truck, and in essence, that's a self-truck inspection, and we do those as pest management business, I can say, look, I need to have at least two bottles on that truck and alert that technician when he gets down to one. In essence, what the software will actually do, if we set this up completely all the way through, it will actually place the actual order to the service manager internally for that technician so that it keeps that truck completely stocked and ready to roll for that week. So the technician will only have to take a manual inventory or in, in essence, a self-truck inspection. Once he enters those data points, the software will look at those data points and then it will actually place the order to your warehouse uh, in order to replenish that truck. We are working on some future stuff here like SDSs and, and labels um, that will be coming soon. And if you're dealing with uh, things that have very complicated names, especially like, you know, Robco soil, uh, rod 18, uh, one eighth inch, we can come in here and actually just give it a simple description like termite rod, uh, if that's the case. And uh, that way your, your technician can actually see what they're asking for as opposed to trying to figure out what this description is here. So there's a lot of stuff you can do with inventory manager and it is a true reconciliation. Now, what I will tell you about this software is it does not flow outside of your company. This is truly a standalone reconciliation software for your business that you as a valued customer of a service that we give to you. There is no charge for this software and you get unlimited amount of support. It's just one of the things that set us apart from all other distributors, distributors out there is that we're bringing technology tools and digital tools to the market and helping our PMP partners with their inventory needs and also helping them put cash flow back on their bottom line. So once the software is set up, how does it work? Well, internally, you decide for your branch, who is gonna approve branch orders here? You will add their emails here. Who do those POs need to flow to? So if it's procurement again, you will add them here, or maybe it's just a manager, or maybe your full admin people. You will also set up who's in charge of restocking orders. Where do technician requests from the warehouse? So if you're using Google Docs now or maybe Excel sheets, we're basically doing the same thing, but we're using an app to do the, uh, do the reconciliation with. You're also capturing that data live so that you're not trying to reconcile at the end of the month and figure out what happened later. You're actually seeing every transaction happen um, as it's being requested through the app. So restocking is stocking is truck and orders is branch. So we will put the service managers or maybe managers that will approve any technician order that would be pulled from your warehouse to the software. We have also added a component where it will remind your technician to take a manual inventory of their vehicle. Inventory is very, very dynamic on a truck, so we can tell it, hey, weekly, every Friday at 3 p.m., we want it to send a manual inventory request to that technician so that he gets his truck counted up in whole units. We are not gonna ask techs uh, for this software uh, to count you know, thirds of bottles or half of bottles, because that would be only as good as their best guess. What we're gonna ask them to do is actually count it in whole units. Because once a bottle hits a truck, your cost to route revenue is already starting to be figured out at that point. So once you place it on the bottle and they break the seal, it's already been applied to the cost to route revenue. And I will tell you that you'll be able to run that type of number out of this software is cost to route revenue because it is capturing everything as it's happening live. And if I wanna see a pull after a technician pull, then I can just hit, simply hit a refresh and it will give me a refresh number on what I transferred out of my warehouse and what my dollar amount is in my warehouse. If I wanna look into a rolling warehouse, I can click on that and this here says it has $27.88 and it tells me exactly what's on that truck. 
So that is all part of the setup features. To place orders in the software, you live under the operation key. We'll take a manual inventory of your warehouse as it start stands today, and it will give us a total sum of your total value of exposure in the warehouse when it comes to inventory. To place orders to send those POs internally, you will simply go here, place order, and then you shop on this as if you were shopping from Amazon or eBay or any of those type of platforms. And I can type a note to a distributor, need by Friday. I can come down here and place an order for a couple of those. But if you notice here, it's telling me that I've already have 13 on the shelf. So before placing an order, I may look at this and glance at this cart and say, hey, it's already telling me I've got 13, but I'm gonna go ahead and order three for this particular presentation and maybe order a couple of those. And what we allow you to do is we allow you to put any other supplier on there. So if you're gonna start looking at cost to route revenue and maybe you do some rodent exclusion or backpack uh, mist blowing, you should be able to add your 15 one gas to that. So if you see here, I have 32 gallons in the warehouse, but I'm gonna go ahead and order four more from Home Depot. And then I'm gonna come down here and preview that. And the software will separate the Viserys order from the Home Depot order. You can submit that. And then what happens internally, a PO gets emailed to all of your approvers within the company. And this is the, the, the PDF that you will forward to the pertinent supplier that it belongs to. If this is a Viserys one, then you just simply email us this purchase order and then we will take care of it for you. If it's a Home Depot order, say like this one here, then what I can do is go to my PDF and I can actually print that off or maybe a service manager or something like that to say, hey, here's your shopping list for Home Depot. Once you arrive with it at the warehouse, I'll simply just hit receive. I'll verify that the four gallons came and then I will submit it. Now what the software does is it goes from current to a receiver and it has now added it to your warehouse is what Viserys calls a put away. We can actually just stick it on the shelf and it is now part of our physical count. One of the things that you weren't able to do, and this was kind of one of the things when I ran my pest management business is when I got a pallet of stuff, I would go through it to reconcile it against the bill of lading and I would notice that maybe something was missing that I thought I had ordered. Immediately what I would do is I would pick up the phone and call and order another case. And before I knew it, my back order showed up and also the new order showed up. And now I have purchased an extra case that I really didn't intend on because I really didn't know if it was gonna show up or not show up. So now what you can do is when you go to your uh, app on your phone, because this does work on every single smart device you own today, you would download it from the Apple or Google Play Store, uh, but will not be active if you try to do it now be until I build the software for you. But if I came into the receiver and hit receive, and I say, look, I didn't get the injection tips, I could change that to zero. It will drop three here so that I know that those did not arrive, but I did get the fire ant bait. Now I can simply just receive that and it will put away just the fire ant bait for me. And that way it leaves a 484B behind. And now I've got a 484A that I did receive in. So now I know I've got a current back order. If I wanted to see a quick view of all of my back orders without having to open them one by one, I can simply go to my reports tab and I can come down to warehouse order list here and say, look, for my south location, I'm gonna look at all pending current orders as of today to see what I have on back order so that I don't inadvertently order something again. It will tell me exactly what is on back order. That way I do not pick up the phone and, and place that order again. I can see them all here on my list. If your Baceris rep calls you and says, hey, there's a really nice rebate point of sale, you may wanna take advantage of it. I can actually run a purchase by vendor report out of here and say, look, I wanna see what I spend with all manufacturers. It will tell me and break it down for you so that you can make a very um, a good decision on whether or not you should buy or load up on that promotion, uh, promotional uh, program or not. And you may even ask your sales rep, hey, how long is that promotion good for? Looks like I'll probably go through a couple months of it. Let's go ahead and load up on a couple months of that promotion. Again, this is designed to put cash flow back on your bottom line. If I just want to look at all of my inventory on hand, including my trucks, I can simply come in here and say, look, my South Branch. And I want to include trucks in that view, and I want to generate that. It will actually show me where all of my inventory is. It will break down each truck, and it will give you a total grand total. So if I were a service manager or a branch manager and I saw 65,700, 
I may go through this list to find out where all of my stuff is and use it up before I go making more purchases for my business. So very good information. Again, this is capturing it all live. You are not looking backwards on this. The KPI that most companies run is cost to route revenue. What I can do at the end of every month is I can add my production numbers for each technician and submit it to the software. If I wanted to come out here and run a report on my production, I can go to orders and come down to production. And let's just say I want to run for my South branch. And it's always looking a month behind because you close out previous month. It'll tell you here that I, if I were a technician, is are running an 8.93% cost to route revenue. Now, what I will tell you guys that are on the call that uh, the national average that I'm seeing across the country is about six and a half to seven percent. So that kind of gives you a good target. So if you're looking at that PL and I'm looking at that MS line on that PL, should hover around that six and a half to seven percent. Some companies run a little more aggressive at four and five. To me, that's living on the edge a little bit, but this gives you a pretty good view. Now, what I will tell you that this software was never designed to catch theft or side jobs, but it will very, very quickly in that number right there. So it's right at your fingertips. You can run this at the 15th of the month or you can run it you know, uh, at the end of the month as you close out. A lot of good valuable information that comes out of this. What are we looking at uh, for the future, uh, Viserys, when it comes to inventory manager? We are working on your accounting people now. We are working on things like segregating invoice into certain categories. So uh, what you can do here is, excuse me, let me move this box out of the way. Well. I can create what's called product categories and assign them to each product. So for instance, if this were a piece of equipment, I may want to come in here and assign it an equipment category and maybe even supplies if I wanted to add that, but this would probably be more in the, in the line of equipments. Now you have the luxury of setting up your own categories like and control, general and set control, uh, maybe a road and exclusion or whatever categories you want to submit to the software, you can. And then what it starts to do is it starts to segment all of your products down into certain categories so that I can run a purchase by category report out of the software. That is very, very big when it comes to equipment and depreciating for the tax man at the end of the year. If I were to come in here into my reports and do purchase by category, I can just say, look, my South branch in this date range, I wanna look at everything I've spent in, let's just say in equipment. So I can generate that and it'll tell me that I've spent $4,011.94 in equipment because I've assigned those categories to those particular products. These are some of the new features and new enhancements that we're starting to add to the software to really help when it comes down to the accounting purposes of it. Now, the life of a technician, they only live under the service app. They will take inventory of their truck. They will place requests to the warehouse just like the warehouse does. They will complete tasks here, those tasks button that I set up, I'm gonna take manual inventory, or maybe place an order to the warehouse. Maybe a manager wants to pull on a certain day without interruption and place it in their locker, maybe in a plastic bin with their name on it, uh, whatever it may be. We can assign certain tasks to them to, to take uh, inventory of their truck. So that's pretty much about a 20,000 foot view of the software. It probably does a lot more that I haven't touched on. And if you would like a personal demo of the software, I'll get a little more in depth on what it does and what its capabilities are. Um, all you have to do is reach out to your Viserys rep and let them, uh, let them know um, that you want to uh, set up a demo and I'll be happy to do that for you. Or you can contact me directly. And uh, my email, I believe, was on this uh, invite with you guys. Uh, you can contact me directly. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Andrew. Richard, thank you so much. A uh, very informative presentation. Um, we do have some questions in. Um, Chris, I'll turn it over to you to uh, uh, manage these. And um, folks, you can just go into the questions tab. It looks like we already have a few. Thanks, Andrew. Um, here's a question for you, John, asking, um, how much decaying organic material do flies need to thrive? Well, that's a that's that's a good question. But you know, going back to my earlier point, you know, you got a table leg that's straddling a grout line on a quarry tile floor. Um, that is if the moisture and the organic material, I mean that's that's enough to hold that's enough to hold to support a small larval population. 
And those small larval populations end up being the game whack-a-mole that we play in our accounts because you seem like you got the pressure down over here and then it pops back up. So it, it doesn't it doesn't take much. Um, I don't have anything um, like I, I don't I don't have an anecdote to tell you like you know like a teaspoonful or anything like that. But just think about it in the context of that how much how much could build up underneath the table legs uh, straddling that growl line in a kitchen. Thanks, John. Um, here's another one for you asking, why did you choose pyroproxifen instead of s hydroprene for the IGR? That is a technical question that I am not even going to pretend that I have <laughs> the, uh, the technical expertise to answer. Uh, the decision was made. Um, we had, you know, we get, you get very good, um, results. I do know that, I, I, I do know that there's differences in the characteristics between those two active ingredients you're talking about. Um, however, um, they'll get you to the same place, but why that decision was made, I don't know. Both of these are labeled for drains, and that's the key takeaway, the IGR that you're selecting. Make sure that it is labeled for drains. Thanks, John. Um, Richard, here's a question for you asking, um, is the software really for a small PMP or a larger PMP with, say, five trucks? Is it worth the time for a single PMP owner operator? Um, he's saying the DF market has like 600 plus pest companies. Most are smaller in size. So the answer to your question, yes. The, the software was actually designed for the small PMP uh, before we rolled out to enterprise level uh, size companies, simply because it's a good discipline for a PMP that is looking at future growth in in place already um, as a feature, and then they become kind of at it as they start to teach their new technicians and so on and so forth. So, uh, to kind of give you a, a, a better idea, if I were to look at the users across the country, I would say a good 75% of them are anywhere in the four to five truck range. Um, and I have very, very large enterprise in the country as well. So, the answer to your question is yes, it's a great discipline to start. Uh, it simply just is a tool that is not connected to anybody's systems uh, to start that discipline and really start to give you that product trend so that you can make uh, better decisions when it comes to uh, purchasing products. Thanks, Richard. Um, another one's asking, so there's no way to get this software without being a Viserys customer. Is that right? The, well, if you're not a Viserys customer, we certainly like to convince you to be a Viserys uh, customer. <laughs> But we'd love to give you a demo to kind of show you what it will do. Um, obviously, you know, as, as Viserys, we're always trying to bring added value to the market. So uh, let's set up a demo and let's talk about that moving forward. But uh, the answer to your question is yes, I have set up some companies that weren't Viserys customers. And after they start seeing and, and what we can do for you, um, they eventually become Viserys customers. And uh, I'd love to entertain that with you. Uh, Richard, that's a that's a great question also because I think one of the key distinctions that that this software provides is that it is distributor agnostic right like you don't have to it does it's not just for products that you buy from Viserys you may be buying products from other distributors or in other industries this works with that as well correct that that is correct so if you're if you're stocking any type of inventory whatsoever because Viserys made this a standalone software uh, to to reconcile all of your material and all of really all of your assets within your business. Uh, yes, the answer is it's a really good point, Andrew, is that this was really made uh, to track all segments of your business, not just the Sarah's. Um, you know, for instance, I have a company that I just brought on that is mainly a gutter company, but they do have maybe 5% in pest and most of it's, you know, uh, gutter control or maybe uh, some gutter exclusion material and stuff like that, that they do purchase from Viserys. So not a big, large Viserys customer, but we're helping them in his gutter business as well. So um, the answer is yes. I mean, this is, uh, you don't have to be a Viserys customer, but if there's things that we can provide for you, we'd certainly like to add them to the software for you. Thanks, Richard. Um, let's see, here's another question for you, John, asking, uh, does using fans to help dry things out help in the beginning of a small fly kill? Oh my gosh, yeah. So um, yeah, it's a great pickup. Um, moist organic material in all stages of decay. 
I mean, in, in all stages of development. So if we take one of those components out, take one of those legs of the stool, then the stool falls. So there's a couple of reasons why you want to talk to customers about possibly employing floor, floor plans in the plant into the program. One, um, even though the small flies can fly large distances, they don't like to fly against wind currents. They, it takes a lot of energy for them to navigate. And the second thing is we're circulating the air. That means that we're, that means we're drying out you know, the, the, the environment and we're taking away that moisture component. So by all means, yes, floor fans are a good, good first step. John, this next question is also for you, and they're wanting to know, is NIBOR D safe in septic systems? Um, it's labeled for drains, and yes, that includes septic and, 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 and sewer systems. So the, the short answer is yes. Okay. I don't like the word safe, but, 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 but it is labeled for both, and it is, it is non-caustic. It's not corrosive. It doesn't have any VOCs or vol volatile chemicals. Um, there's a bunch of things I could rattle off. But yes, it is labeled for drains and, 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 and it's not harmful to drains or septic systems. All right, let's see. Uh, keep those questions coming in, folks. We still have some time before we hit the, the noon hour. Uh, but this next one, Richard, is asking, um, is the login information the same as the login for the Viserys website to get into the uh, inventory manager? It, it is not. So, uh, in, uh, so Viserys Inventory Manager lives on its own domain name. Um, it's outside of the Viserys.com. It is a software that I actually build for you in the background um, of the Viserys system uh, because it is not tied to our system. Because you can add other suppliers to the software um, and other vendors that you may use within the business, say, for instance, Centricon, uh, those types of things, um, it is not tied to our system, so therefore it's a standalone on its own uh, web domain. All right, thanks, Richard. Here's a couple of questions I'm going to combine for you. I ask in, um, is the software free, and how long would it take to set up with three vans? If you're a service customer, yes, it's free. And if you're not a service customer, it is still free. <laughs> so free, <laughs> free. Uh, so it generally takes, uh, so for one company with one branch, maybe three trucks, um, because I help you from start to finish, uh, I do not leave you. I give you 100% support in setting it up in the way you want it to function and work. Um, generally, it takes about an hour, hour and a half, and we'll have you up and running. And that's even when I'm working with a one branch say 23 to 25 truck it still takes about an hour and a half there's a lot of stuff that we will upload together um, from excel sheets that i will provide to you that we will just import right into the software and we'll have you up and running in no time perfect and richard kurt wants to sign up so i'll make sure to forward on his information to you so you can reach out to him directly um he's, he's convinced he's like i'm i'm, I'm in that's um, awesome yeah so john here are a couple questions for you now asking how often do you need to apply the product and how much time is needed before the restaurant can open yeah those are those are both great questions well if you, you're applying nibor d um uh, if you're applying the ready to use you, you, there's no consideration um as far as time you know you could do that while the facility is in operation um, the common question I get was, how long do they have to wait? Well, you know, and, and here's another one too. People go, well, the longer the foam stays in foam, the better, right? Well, no, that's that's really that's that's the exact opposite of what we want because if the foam stays stays foam and it doesn't dissipate, then the active ingredient stays in the middle of the drain line instead of going to the walls of the drain line, which is what we want. Um, you want that that foam to be able to dissipate. The longer, obviously, the longer you could let it sit there, the better. Um, and then uh and then the other question was i'm sorry um on, on the operations oh so and then you know if you're doing if you're using regular nibor d we're doing this in 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 off hours anyway there is just there's no there's no like time that 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 it has to be vacated or anything like that that's that's not it at all um i, I the uh you know as soon as you do that foam application you know they 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 could go to work it's just that you don't want to be mixing and 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 doing you know you can't be mixing as per the label and applying with the regular nibor d say in a pump foamer while they're in production 
um, because the concern there is for, for the food contamination. Okay, thanks, John. Let's see, we have, this one's also for you asking, uh, this may be an odd question, but could one use Nibor DIGR in a house plant to kill fungus gnats? Uh, you know, that's not an odd question. That's a great question, the answer is no. Um, borates are also a fungal toxin, um, which uh, um, would work against the chlorophyll in the house plant. Um, not, uh, borates are not labeled for soil applications. Um, fungus gnats, my best recommendation, if you do have a fungus gnat infestation, um, identify that plant. That is the quote unquote hot plant. You can do this with monitor stickers. Um, you know, Viserys has um, two-sided yellow monitor cards from various companies that are out there. You determine what the hot plant is or the one that has the larval infestation. And then we, uh, we, we take and you um, remove the potting soil about six inches and then go back with fresh potting soil after that. But under no circumstances are, is Nibor DIGR to be applied to soil or house plants. Thanks for clarifying that, John. Um, this next one's also for you asking, I haven't seen the label yet. What other pests are on the label of Nibor D? Um, well, uh, let's see. Uh, you're talking about Nibor D and then also Nibor the, D. Not, yeah, Nibor D in, in the, uh, the, 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 the wettable dust has a wide, wide range of pests on it. The Nibor D plus IGR um, has, uh, has um, small flies, drain flies, forward flies, um, and then also cockroaches uh, on, on the label for, for contact kill. Um, if you're dealing with a cockroach problem, um, I would suggest you, you know, reach out to me and we can discuss a strategy um, because you want to be uh, more aggressive. And I would suggest using um, the, the original formulation of the Nibor D um, to, to, get, to get us started um, there. So uh, there, there's a wide host of, la of pests on both labels. Okay. Pam, I see your uh, request for Richard to reach out to you to sign up. So I'll make certain he gets your contact information. Thank you very much. Um, here's one, John, again, asking, so any suggestions on what you can tell me to tell a restaurant owner to clean up? And even after like nine months, they, they're, they're not complying. Any, any tips, you know, trying to get them to basically help themselves? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So that's always a challenge. Um, I suggest using kind of the Jerry Maguire method, you know, help me help you, help me help you. <laughs> you know, and, and also to, um, you know, it doesn't do anybody any good if you just go and you say you're nasty. I mean, that's, <laughs> that doesn't help anybody. But, but at the same time, you know, one, maybe one or two things, maybe, maybe the baby step, but I guess the point of, and I don't know if I was, was clear enough, a lot of these areas that are in question that are this moist organic material that you know is contributing to the problem. Now we can take and do applications to that crud and we can, we can make that crud residue laden with the borate. So the next time the insect um, goes to breed in it, as in the case of the small fly or goes to dine on it in the case of the cockroach, it's going to be, it's, it's going to be, um, you know, terminal to them. So that was kind of my point. We're going to just change the conversation. Yeah. You want to tell them to clean. You always want to tell them to clean. Food safety and sanitation is always very important, but some of this deep embedded stuff, especially with these cryptic breeding areas that are deep down in there, this is a way to deliver an active ingredient to it and, and make that so it's residue laden. So you're not having to have that conversation again. All right, let me keep checking here. Um, Richard, we've got more and more people interested in BIM. That's great news. Lynn, I see your request. And Gregory, I also see yours. So I will make sure Richard gets your information and he'll be in touch soon. Uh, with that, folks, it's about the top of the hour. So we want to thank you for your time today. On behalf of John, Richard, and everyone here at Viserys, thank you for your time today. And like I mentioned, be on the lookout later this afternoon. You will receive an email that contains a link to today's recording. Everyone um, have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yep, thank you for your time. We appreciate it.